I am Dr. Pam Straker, and I am the Director of Operations for the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. I'm welcoming you here today. Uh, most of you have seen me kind of walking around. Um, this is actually the first symposium um, for the transport program. And we have the luck of having Dr. Riley um, have prepared um, a, an introduction, and so we will see that shortly. Um, and we have our leaders here, and we will hear from them also. Okay, and I thank you so much for taking the time to come. This will be an annual event, and so we hope it will grow larger and larger. Um, we're anticipating about 100 people today, but you know how things go. People come and go as they can. Um, so I'm hoping that the gentleman is upstairs so that we can begin with Dr. Riley. Good morning. Thank you for joining us at our first annual Transport Symposium. While I'm not able to be there in person, I would like to thank you and welcome you. Today we are celebrating a milestone at the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center, our first NIH endowment grant totaling $10 million. This prestigious award will support a program known as TRANSPORT, the Translational Program of Health Disparities Research Training. TRANSPORT provides a foundation for cultivating a diverse biomedical research workforce and positions Downstate as a national leader in translational disparities in population health research. I am proud to serve along with Drs. Carlos Patu and Moro Salafu as a co-principal investigator of this endowment grant. Our deans are moving to increase diversity in our healthcare workforce across all of our colleges and schools. We must be equally diligent in increasing diversity in the biomedical research workforce. Racial and ethnic minorities are woefully underrepresented in NIH funding. According to a study of trends in NIH funding, one to 3% of research program grants are awarded to black or Latino investigators. And 26 to 38% are awarded to women. This endowment award will help us to become a leader in recruiting and training the next generation of minority researchers. Transport will support research training across a spectrum of educational stages, from undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate training. Transport will also equip new investigators with the skills to address research in areas in genomics, clinical trials, and community-engaged research. Throughout the day, you will hear from a panel of speakers, as well as the executive members of the Transport team. You will hear about many of the programs that will be supported under this endowment grant. Much has been done in this short period, and there is so much more to be accomplished. In less than 12 months, among its many accomplishments, Transport has established a summer research program and have recruited students from Medgar Evers College, Brooklyn College, and SUNY Albany. This is important as we seek to engage and enhance partnership opportunities. The first cohort of six students have participated in research this past summer with faculty who include Drs. Michelle Patu, Michael Reinhardt, and Carla Buten Foster. We've created a postdoctoral fellowship in translational health disparities research for junior faculty. We've established a research training program for junior faculty modeled after the successful NIH Pride program directed by Dr. Mohamed Boudir. Now over the next several weeks, we'll begin a monthly series on health disparities research that will serve as an incubator for investigators to develop new research collaborations. We have also collaborated with our partners in Albany who have also received a similar endowment on some initiatives. We recently received $750,000 from the Empire Innovation Program to support joint health disparities research between SUNY Albany and SUNY Downstate. Additionally, Transport will produce a critical mass of trained health disparities investigators and provide career advancement opportunities. The ultimate goal to build a workforce that can contribute to the elimination of health disparities in Brooklyn and beyond. I would like to thank the entire team who helped to assemble the data necessary to make our application 
Sterling success, including Drs. James Diaz and Lawrence Shell, as well as Vincent Dilio from SUNY Albany. Dr. Pamela Straker and Lakia Maxwell from the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, the Office of Research Administration, the Office of Diversity Education and Research, and the Office of Student Affairs, as well as all other faculty and staff who have been instrumental in making this a reality. Thanks to all of you who have contributed to the successful creation of Transport. Have a great day. As we continue through the day, there will be a couple of changes um, in the programming, and one of them is that Dr. Salafu will be the first person to present today. Um, and I'd like to invite Dr. Salafu to the stage. You all know him, but his bio is on the back of the program. Let's do it the Brooklyn way. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay, that's very good. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, to all of you for coming for this symposium. Uh, as the President said and Pam said, this is our first uh, transport, and now you know the meaning of transport, so we're going to be using the acronym throughout transport, transport, transport. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, my job here today is to get you to understand what the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center is and how it connects with the uh, transport program. Obviously, the President has done a very good job of explaining what transport is, so I'm not going to to those details, but I'll tell you what uh, that uh, integration with uh, BHDC is. <clears throat> Can I have my slides? Before I go, though, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people in the audience uh, who are really very important to our research. Um, Larry, could you get up and be recognized from UAlbany? That's my counterpart at UAlbany. <clears throat> and then uh, James Diaz is uh, Vice President for Research from Louis Alban and our former dean who is now the PI, the contact PI for transport. Where is Carla? Carla is the, all right, Carla, everybody knows Carla. So it's, I just want to acknowledge publicly that the, the name transport, the acronym was, uh, you know, the thought for the transport acronym was Carla's idea. So thank you very much for that. Okay. <clears throat> So what is BHDC? Every community in the United States needs some form of um, community engagement, especially from the academic perspective. So sometime in 2002, the Brooklyn Borough President commissioned uh, a group uh, called the Milano Group. They did a very nice review of the challenges in Brooklyn, how to provide care to the underserved population in Brooklyn. And they came up with a report. That report was named the Milano Report. And the Milano Report recommended that the Brooklyn Borough President meet with an academic medical center and a community-based organization to put together a team that would look into the issues of Brooklyn's health, particularly a group that is going to be the think tank of Brooklyn, study the issues, provide recommendations for policy recommendations. And that was the beginning of the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. So sometime in 2004, the Borough President of Brooklyn then met with our president, uh, Rosa, and uh, they pulled Atta Ash <clears throat> into the equation, and then they formed what is now known as the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. So the role of BHDC, Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, is to organize the research that is community-based, that is within the community, and that is generated by the community, to be able to help the people who are suffering from a whole lot of health disparities issues. Uh, in Brooklyn and across uh, New York City. So that's how it was formed. And since then, uh, we've had leadership changes. Our first leader was uh, Dr. Clark. He had left the institution, and then uh, we had Dr. Brown, who was there briefly. Dr. Brown is a nephrologist in this institution. Uh, then he was there for <coughs> briefly, and then I became the uh, director in 2010. So these are the area, these are the, this is SUNY Downstate, and then the other Ash Institute, and then the Brooklyn Borough President. So the rationale for this structure was to make sure that academic medicine has a voice in the community. That was the rationale for the structure. And you cannot have a voice in the community unless you are working with somebody who really knows the community. And that was the rationale for the other Ash Institute. 
So, so although it's more expansive, now we've expanded to more than 45 community-based organizations, but that is the core. The core is to make sure that there is an academic, community, uh, and government partnership to address health disparities issues all over the country, uh, particularly in Brooklyn. So these are our current leaders, but myself, and we have Marilyn from the uh, Atta Ash Institute, and then Sandra from the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. So that is the current structure now. Now, this structure doesn't change much uh, because we want stable leadership. Uh, this is the agreement on paper for the organization to be formed. So whenever somebody uh, you know, goes off from the SUNY side, somebody replaces. Whenever somebody goes off from the community side, somebody replaces. And somebody from the Borough President's Office you know, is not in that same position, the position changes and then they replace somebody. So that is the structure right now dealing with the issues uh, uh, in Brooklyn. Our staff members, you know them already, so I'm going to skip this one. And we have a program advisory committee. There is no way to do this kind of work without having to be advised by an external advisory committee. It's mandatory, it's required, so we have one. And we have very good uh, people all across the world. They understand health disparities issues, and they contribute a lot to our writings. So we have uh, Dr. Andrewley, we have uh, Dr. Isling, uh, Francesca Gaini. All these people are heavily funded from the NIH. Uh, she's at uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he's in Texas. We have in our audience uh, Dr. Shell. He's the director for the Center for Elimination of Minority Health Disparities at U Albany. He's been very, very helpful to us in terms of trying to get uh, this particular uh, transport program funded. As a matter of fact, when we considered applying for the application, I spoke to Dr. Patu, and then I said, well, look, we have to have somebody from U Albany participate in this. And he said, do you know somebody? I said, of course I know somebody. I know Dr. Uh, Shell. Let me give me a call. And when I spoke to Larry, I didn't realize that they also had exact same I mean, uh, S21, funded from the NIH, to do the exact same thing, an endowment award of $10 million. So when he said, oh, we've already been funded for that, so wow, congratulations. So would you be able to, would you like to be part of our, you know, program advisory committee? He said, yes. I said, okay, thank you very much. And he wrote us a beautiful letter, and thank you, and actually reviewed our write-ups, and uh, that helped us to get this grant. So thank you very much. And then we have, you know, our, uh, Dr. Chow and uh, Sherwin from, from, uh, from NYU, uh, Monica Sweeney, uh, who is the uh, chair of the, um, the Department of Health Policy in the School of Public Health at Downstate. Um, so those are our program advisory committee members. So these are standing members. Whenever somebody is out, we replace somebody. And whenever we are writing a grant, we let them know what we're doing. And we, the accurate review, for those of them who are available, the accurate review our work to make sure that provide input that is important uh, for the application to be successful. So we've been very busy. Um, this is, it's amazing when you are doing academic work, we tend to focus so much on the successes, which is good, but for every one success there are like 10 failures. So what, we, what I'm telling you in this slide is what we have been successful in doing. The number of failures is unbelievable. If you're going to be distracted because you failed, you would never make it. If you really are going to be distracted because you failed, you are never going to make it. Last year, for instance, we did 13 submissions, 13 NIH submissions. And we got one. But the one is $10 million. That is how you have to think about it. Uh, and we have to keep revising, talking to the right people, and trying to figure out what did I do wrong, what, how, what can I do better next time? That is the approach that everybody has to have. Not that I tried and I didn't feel nobody likes me. Nobody hates you either. Nobody even knows you exist. We don't even know you exist. So there's no reason for anybody to hate you or don't, doesn't like your application. This is peer review. You have to respect what your peers say. If you're not willing to accept what peers say, you cannot make it in this environment, academic. So the advice is that when you write something that is not funded, when you write a paper that is not published, Nobody is against you. Those are your peers, period. You have to say, what do you think? How can I be better? How can I write this? Who should I talk to to improve what I'm doing? That should be the natural position for all of us if we're going to succeed. So this is just to tell you where we are right now. And this is good because uh, we have $24 million that uh, has come to the center since we started. And that's really very good. 
So we are going to be focusing now on increasing partnerships, which is obvious, disseminating information, which we have been doing very well. Uh, Palm and Lucky are really amazing. We have contacts. Our mailing list is thousands and thousands of people. Any information we get, we just shoot out to the Brooklyn residents and uh, people respond. We have an open portal where people can actually ask questions to BHDC and we actually respond to those questions. Um, we have a large network of CBOs, like I said. We have more than 45 that actually participate. They come, we meet with them every three months. It's a huge undertaking, but they love to come to the balance. They want to know what is going on. And so we keep them engaged, and uh, by that engagement, we get to know what they think. And part of the, um, the, the requirement for a successful application in health disparities is actually to engage the community. If you don't engage the community very well, you're unlikely to be successful. So there are two terminologies, which you might hear today or in your readings. One of them is community-based participatory research which means that you actually go to the community and you ask them, what is your problem? They will tell you your problem and you design research around it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to go door to door knocking and say, what is your problem? There is a process to getting that done. That process is called Delphi. In other words, you probe the community by surveys, they tell you broad things, then you narrow it, then you narrow it, then you narrow it until you get to what the community is really focusing on. And that is community-based participatory research. That is the ideal. The other one is, Community engaged research, which means that you are engaging the community but you are not really taking the ideas, which is, for instance, we know that maternal mortality is a problem in Brooklyn, or maternal mor morbidity is a problem in Brooklyn. So we will go to the community and we will say, okay, we know you have the problem and we want to solve it and we have a solution. Just help us to solve it. So you are engaging the community in the solution. That is community engaged research. That is less ideal in terms of research and being able to understand what the community needs. Uh, uh, but either way, if you put up a very good application and you uh, address the issues of the community in a way that makes sense, you could still be funded and you can find the answers uh, that would then come back and help the community. So the transport team is here. You, all, you know all of them. Uh, the last people I'm going to mention by name because they may not be here and uh, they did a lot of work in helping us. Mark Stewart is the dean for the School of Graduate Studies, Mohammed Bushdier was mentioned, Michelle Patu is no audience. Michelle, you want to raise your hand and stand up? Okay, that's Michelle. Michelle is the director of the Institute for Genomic Health. Uh, she's a psychiatrist and geneticist, right? Genetic psychiatrist. Uh, she likes the genes. Um, Tracy Wilson might come in sometime today. Amy Efable uh, might come in today. And Michael Joseph, uh, these are all from the School of Public Health. Uh, so we have the School of Graduate Studies, um, that is Mark Stewart, the School of Public Health, the College of Medicine. Um, I saw Shirley here this morning, uh, Shirley Girard, from the, um, from the School of Nursing. So, so we are trying to be as comprehensive as possible from the transport perspective. In other words, transport is not designed for any particular school. It's designed for the entire campus. And so anyone who has an idea or who wants to participate in the programs is welcome to do so and um, we'll be happy to collaborate with that person. And we want to also acknowledge Barry Smith from the Dean's Office who worked with Dr. Patu really, really very well to get this done. And when the grant came in, all the paperwork uh, that was needed uh, in collaboration with Palm and Lakia was able to do all that stuff for us. And, and John, who was very instrumental in putting the uh, actual application uh, last minute pieces together. Okay, so the objectives are what? We wanted to create this program because there's a need. The president has already made those remarks, and uh, I don't want to relate those points again. Uh, he made a very good remark on that. The video was very explicit. But there's a real, real shortage. If you, there's actually published literature that shows that if you want to solve the issue of health disparities, you have to have enough people engaged in that conversation. That's number one. And you have to have enough minority people also engaged in that conversation, the research itself. That is well documented, right? So if we don't have enough people of minority extraction, uh, underrepresented minorities, who can be trained to be part of the conversation, it's really, really very difficult to get to the solutions. That is the goal, in summary, of transport. We want to increase that capacity to be able to So this is the organization. Um, so um, you 
see that uh, we will be recruiting postdoctoral candidates or junior faculty members. They will undergo uh, a summer training program in year one. And these are the areas we're going to be focusing on, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, HIV, mental health. All these areas are what we call the content expert areas, the content expert areas. So there are going to be mentors in these areas that these trainees are going to be connected to. In year one, they will receive basic training, and then in year two, the expectation is that they will come back to the program well prepared. Uh, they would have written, worked with their mentor and written a grant, which is NIH style, that's actually reasonably prepared and could be submitted. That's what we expect in year two. It doesn't have to be submitted, but it could be submitted. So the, it has to be developed to that level by the time you get to summer two, right? And then that's the end of the, uh, the two-year period. And then hopefully we can recruit those people who do very well into the faculty. And we expect publications and grant applications and that we can keep some of those people into the system. Or those people will be qualified to join other systems where they can, they can do health disparities research. So that is the structure. Now the theme, you can see the theme here, the theme, whether you're doing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, HIV, or mental health, we wanted the themes in these areas to actually focus on health disparities, genomic health, because all these areas have a component of genomic disparities. And they probably have the social determinants as well, of course. You know that, housing, income, that kind of stuff. We know that this is pervasive. It's always there. The one that we haven't been doing much is the genomic health. What are the differences, the biologic differences that uh, creates these disparities? And so we want to make sure there's a theme across the various content areas. So this one um, tells you the undergraduate programs that we will be creating. Um, we would have a program called Sprint. This will attract undergraduate students uh, every summer. They would be recruited to, I mean, the goal is to get these people to be interested in downstate programs, and hopefully they would end up in downstate programs. And then hopefully they will end up uh, into um, uh, our research programs, and hopefully they will end up with publications, grant applications, and of course, retention of faculty. But the goal here really is to trigger this interest in health uh, careers in uh, the undergraduate uh, um, campuses. So, for instance, Mega Evers, we have a relationship with Mega Evers and Brooklyn College. Um, if we could trigger a lot of these underrepresented minorities to be interested in their careers, they can connect with us and hopefully we can get them to our graduate programs and hopefully they can be junior faculty members and the like. And then one day they'll be here giving the talk. That is the goal. And then for the, um, the, there are other opportunities to get junior faculty members from our own schools and, and, and training programs. And uh, we are working very hard to get them recruited into transport. And the goal is to go through the same thing as in figure one for those junior faculty members who want to join transport uh, for the two year program. And uh, hopefully they will end up with publications, grant applications, and then we can retain them in the faculty. So, the, my last slide talks about the impact. We would provide a rigorous research training infrastructure that would produce the mass that is needed to make uh, this whole health disparities research more meaningful. Now, why are we always talking about research, research, research? It looks like you're a researcher, but that's not the point. You have to understand the issues. That's where we're getting to. We can say, you know, anything we want to say but we cannot make it into policy unless you have some backup. You have to have a rationale for creating policy. So all this research we're doing is going to end up in somebody's desk, let's say the president's desk, and then he will sign something. That's what it means. You have to have the evidence behind the interventions that would decrease health disparities. That's why we're so focused on the research piece of it. Of course, the dissemination is very good, the campaigns are very good, the outreach is all very good to, to people, but until we get the real answers to the very, very important biologic or social questions, it's really very hard for policy to be effectuated. 
And until policy is effective, either at the local level or at the national level, it's really very hard to influence uh, health disparities on a larger scale. So that is the reason why we're focusing on the research piece of it. So that is the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much again for coming, and I'm looking forward to a very, very productive discussion this morning and the afternoon. Thank you very much. We are here to talk about transport, and I'm going to move from the conceptual and policy-based uh, presentation to a bit about why what uh, Dr. Salfu was highlighting, discovery, understanding, knowledge about the population, about the populations we all come from, is so critical. And I will, as I do every day, recognize my wife for now. I'm demented, we'll see. But uh, at anyway, Michelle leads, as we've mentioned, the Institute for Genomic Health. And we really believe that we serve a population that is underserved, not in many ways, but also in our understanding of the basic biology. You know, we come from a, a, a construct where uh, we believe in everyone being equal, but we also need to believe in the need for precision medicine, for understanding the individual, the population and community they come from. And that has a biologic background as well as a social environmental background. Both are critical. We're stressing a bit on the genomics because a lot of the focus to date has been on the social, structural, environmental differences. Very little, in fact, has been done in genomics because our ability to study genomics has really been only recent. So transport, focus on health disparities. You know, we use the term endowment. And everyone understands what endowment is, but I'm going to stick one second to say the goal here is not the $10 million over the next five years. The goal is the $500,000 a year forever that an endowment creates. Our, our goal, because we're allowed to, is to do phenomenally well with this first grant and then submit, we're allowed to submit once more for another $10 million. Because our goal is to have a million dollars of permanent funding. And that changes how our institution can really represent this focus on training and developing careers. And it is, as we've said before, a critical aspect of engaging with the community that we serve, the community that we belong to, the community that both of us immigrated into. Um, so what I want to present relatively briefly is the importance of population health research. The key to translation uh, into how we serve our patients. So it's not just a sterile process of learning at a basic level, but really how does it apply? Um, and the importance of understanding our patients' genomic risk. But the other aspect of this is everyone worries about that focus on risk. Equally important is the focus on resilience. And what I need to highlight as we start looking just at a little bit of uh, history, I'm a carrier of a particular birth defect that I learned about from uh, 23andMe recently, and which means that I carry a mutation that happens one in a thousand people. And if I had a child with someone else who carries that same mutation in one in a thousand people, we would unfortunately have a child with that disorder. The odds of that happening are one in a million. Now, being a carrier has that problem. But the reason the gene exists as it does, the mutation, and keeps being passed on is because in all likelihood, it actually has a particular strength, particular value to us as people. So being a carrier may make me vastly more resistant to a particular disorder. 
or to a particular infection. And therefore, people like me are going to survive that risk, preferentially to others who don't carry that. But it has a side effect that's an unfortunate thing in the very rare event of you having a child with someone that carries the exact same mutation. So as we understand genomics, it's not, as Michelle always says, fate or destiny. It is simply information, and in quite commonly, it is both a value as well as a potential risk. And the more we understand, the more that we can do. Another example is that as we understand a, an individual's particular genomic profile, we also understand how they will respond to particular treatments, the more appropriate treatments to that individual. And in today's treatment of cancer, it has almost become state-of-the-art, and it is state-of-the-art, that you not only have to understand the individual's genomic profile, but the tumor's genomic profile. And by doing that, we have gotten to the point where we can essentially cure people of cancers that were 100 percent fatal just years ago. And why? Because we can target only the tumor cell and not hurt any of the other vital tissue that we need. So let's start with, I, I love starting talks, and this isn't starting, but with family pictures. But there is a point here. Familial is not always genomic. So that's obviously me and Michelle. These are our sons. Both Michelle and I trained at NIMH. So did Michael. Eric is a very good filmmaker, but has nothing to do with health research. However, these phenotypes, the phenotype of having tra trained at NIMH, if it has any genetic component, it is minor, I suspect. I think the fact that he grew up with two researchers as parents who had trained at NIMH probably, in other words, the social environmental construct, is the dominant thing here. But um, we need to understand that that focuses us on familial will carry also strong information on the environment, on the way people are brought up, on the potential to develop in a particular way. Um, I'm also a psychiatrist geneticist, and so what I wanted to highlight here is that two of the major serious mental illnesses that we have devoted our careers to are schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. There's population risks. The risks are significantly increased by 10 to 15 per times if you are related in a first degree way to, or even a second degree way, um, to someone with that illness. But for instance, twins tell us, tells us even more because if you're a dizygotic, a fraternal twin, your shared risk with your twin is identical to any other sibling. If you're a monozygotic, identical twin, your shared risk zooms up to in the order of 50 to 80 percent because your DNA is shared exactly. That's overly simplifying, but the bottom line is it tells us that there is a strong DNA-driven genetic component to risk for illness. It also tells us that you can carry 100% of the risk that may have contributed to an individual, the brother or sister that's sick, and then your identical twin still has a 30, 40, 50% chance of never developing illness. So it tells us environment is also critical. Uh, I want to just tell you that population has always been the focus of our work. So our work 20 some odd years ago actually 28 some odd years ago, started on unique islands um, that are off the coast of Africa and Portugal, the Azores and Madeira Islands. And the goal there was to study populations that had become very much isolated. And that's a strategy that lets us study families and study the population as a whole. And in those studies, we actually collected and ascertained and we have been going there probably 50 times over the last 28 years or more. We have grown to know these families. The patients, 70% of the patients with schizophrenia fall into 60 families. 
in those islands. And we are just now funded through Dr. Ayman Fanous, who is one of our collaborators in the chair of psychiatry, to begin to study, and this is both wonderful and horrible, the fourth generation. So the great-grandchildren who are now turning 20. We started with the great-grandparents, were grandparents then, the parents, the children. There's illness in all these generations. We have known the generation we're studying now from birth. And they are unfortunately, some of them, becoming ill. Uh, a very interesting, very illuminating study that is going to answer things that are specific to that population and generalizable as well. And the other thing that's really important is DNA holding that textbook doesn't read the textbook, doesn't understand how we think of illness, and how we think of illness may have very little to do with what is actually going on from a DNA genomic point of view. So I'm going to give you a series of what's called Manhattan plots. I know we're in Brooklyn, and quite honestly, downtown Brooklyn now looks a lot like this, too. But what they are is this is all studies of genomic profiling that look throughout the genome for where there may be risk mutations across the whole genome. And this is to show you the fact that I'm going to do a lot on schizophrenia, but we were participating in all of these studies. And this was the first study that showed that we actually identified five locations for mutations in the genome that were associated with, um, sch with schizophrenia. The most telling thing is to find five risk loci, and there are many more, involve 10,000 patients, more or less, and over 12,000 controls. So the most important piece of information here is that we, in fact, had to understand that very many, many people were needed. Let me describe that colorful chart on the side, graph. It's telling you about all the different populations that were brought together to be able to collect this population. One of the uh, interesting things about it is that there are differences, but they're all differences within Eurocaucasians. Everyone in these studies were from extraction, from ancestry from Europe. And the basis of most of this work in genomics 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was almost exclusively done with white participants. And there was a scientific justification. And that was that we needed massive numbers. And if we start bringing in multiple populations that were too potentially different, we would decrease the power, the ability to be able to actually find anything. And there was also an assumption that and this is very critical, an assumption that a mutation in one population is not unlikely to be a mutation in another. I agree with that statement, but it's also not that it will always be or that, it all, that the mutations that are relevant in one population are actually particularly relevant in another. I'll quickly go through what happens when you um, advance. This plot involves 26,000 cases, more or less, against 28,000 controls. You're starting to see the downtown Brooklyn skyline, and even more, the Manhattan skyline. Interestingly, that huge finding, let me tell you what that big skyscraper is. That's a finding that has statistical power showing at 10 to the minus 27. There are too many zeros to even get into. But this is showing us locations, and it's also very interesting because it's in the what's called mammalian histocompatibility locus. And that's the area that is very, very much always changing because it responds to infection. It's what develops our immune system's ability to recognize what's not us and to combat infa infection. We're still trying to figure out all the different things within that, because there's so much within that one skyscraper that are directly involved. But it's becoming clearer. But you're also starting to see numerous findings. And at this point, it was 62. All right. This next one, 35,000 cases, 47,000 controls. 
And you're still seeing a very similar skyline, but there's more skyscrapers. There's more findings. Um, we are up to 108. Now, again, the fascinating and unfortunate thing from our point of view, in terms of the populations that we serve, is that 98% of these results relate to Euro-Caucasians. And so Michelle and I have taken it as a priority for the last 12, 13 years of focusing on the populations that are not represented in these findings. And it was a major driver for us to come to Brooklyn. We have been able to establish a relationship with the community as we have in other areas that I think really, really potentiates our ability to start to inform. And I'm not sure how we move forward here. My, ah, okay. So, so far here in Brooklyn, this is an example of schizophrenia being studied with 3,000 African ancestry patients with 3,000 controls. And if you can sort of see, there's maybe a couple of skyscrapers becoming built, and there's actually a couple of spots where we actually are seeing strong statistical significance. For these type of studies, you need to find something that is one times 10 to the minus eight, meaning a one in 10 million chance of uh, not being true. So we have a couple of new findings, but very few because the numbers are so small. If this had been a Euro-Caucasian sample, we would have had exactly the same thing. But we have what we know about all these other people who are of Euro-Caucasian extraction. So when we combine what we know from nearly 100,000 people with what we know from 6,000 people that we've already studied, we find an interesting issue, which is if you look at every one of those little green highlights, those are newly discovered mutations that were not found with 100,000 Caucasians. They're only found when you combine the background that we share with the knowledge that we gained from our population. And that is extremely important because as we add more, and that's the whole goal, we are going to find that there are areas that are predominantly relevant to a Latino population, to a African ancestry population, to any number of specialized populations. We're now dealing with a background of 150,000 Euro-Caucasians, but even a contribution of a focus on our community begins to tell us tremendously more about what's going on. And, okay, there, oops, There's supposed to be more slides. Can we restart? All right, well, so let me tell you what the other slide, one or two, was going to show. The other thing that was also fascinating is that when you find areas that are shared between populations, when you look only in our white population, you find that the best signal we can get, even with 150,000 people, isn't narrow enough to tell us exactly what mutation in that area is relevant, but rather a rather broad inclusion of a number of elements in the genome. When they are shared between African ancestry, possibly Latino, and so on, the more differentiable populations you can bring together, you suddenly find that it may be this wide in Euro-Caucasians, it may be this wide, it tends to be narrower in African ancestry. But when you overlap them to what's likely causing problems, you find a much, much narrower overlap. So if you had a hundred different things that may have fallen in the area of risk to study, the overlap may only have 10 or may only have five. So it's tremendously illuminating 
into how to focus our important uh, research work. So there's tremendous benefit to working on our populations. It is critical in terms of how we begin to apply, to translate what we're learning into how we treat our patients. It is extremely important, and I'm going to give an example that Michelle often gives in her talks, to understand that we need to know our community and our patients in a very specific way. So again, I'm going to use schizophrenia as an example. There are a number of what's called typical antipsychotics, treatments that have been around for 30 years that work. But a lot of work was done to develop new generation antipsychotics that didn't have as many side effects. Well, it turns out that in the African ancestry population, the metabolism of the new agents works out that you have more side effects and less effectiveness than you do if you are Eurocaucasian. So applying the more expensive, newer medications actually has less likelihood of helping. I'm generalizing. It, you need to caution. It works very well on many people. I'm going to add that in a minute. But using the older medication also has better results. However, who is truly at the relevant place of African ancestry versus Eurocaucasian? You're not going to know by how we look. Because what you are at a particular point in your genome has very little to do with what you look like as a phenotype, as an individual. And you may be, apparently, someone who looks like they came from Ireland, the family history is primarily Irish, but for that point, you have your ancestry is African ancestry. Or you might be completely associating yourself as being African ancestry, but as we know, there's a mixture in our population. At that point, you may need to be on one of the newer medications instead because you've inherited a purely Irish <laughs> ancestry there. So we need to get out of the sense that the only thing we need to do is to group in a social way people by how they define themselves. We need to understand the individual as much as we need to understand the communities. So there's relevance to the community because the vast majority of people that look one way or, or another might share certain more of the things. But we can't be that at that level. We have to go beyond that to the fact that we need to understand the individual as well as the community. Thank you very much. I'm going to announce first that I am not Marilyn Frazier. Um, Marilyn was in a car accident this morning, and so she asked me to do some aspect of presenting her slide. She is fine. She was not hurt, but her car is towed away, and so she is going to take care of herself. Um, I wanted just to point out that the presentation we just heard is critically important for us um, as we understand what the, the complications of trying to develop treatments, real treatments for our population. And this will lead into Marilyn's presentation, but as we know, our populations are not necessarily trusting of the medical community because of the many experiments, the many different types of negative outcomes that have happened to people of color. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about Arthur Ashe Institute from that perspective. Um, you can start the slides. Um, years ago, I don't even know. Let's see if I can get this. Years ago, Arthur Ashe came to Downstate, and he determined that, as you know, Arthur Ashe developed um, AIDS as a result of a transfusion, and he felt that the care he was getting was so superior to that which was being received in communities that he wanted to assure that it would be addressed equally or that there would be more resources placed in communities 
to help those people who were suffering with this illness to have better outcomes. So he did come here, um, and I, I always start my talk about Arthur Ashe this way and tell you that I'm old enough to have been there when he dedicated Arthur Ashe um, to this hospital and he, the program to this hospital. And essentially, he wanted to make sure that there were researchers here who had an interest in this population and would make sure that the kinds of things that we're talking about today would go into the future. So this first slide talks about the differences between treatment that is equal, treatment that is equitable, okay, and you can see that box in the middle, everybody's kind of getting the same thing, um, and treatment that is the reality. And as you can see, there's that little guy who's down in the ditch. And so often, our populations wind up being in the ditch when compared to others in terms of resources that are given to the treatments that we all deserve. Um, Arthur Ashe and the Institute have worked to make sure that we begin to do a better job of talking to our communities so that services can be more equal. They can have more equity. Um, and we can approach this from a better perspective. Um, Arthur Ashe really has done treatment in non-traditional settings, and I think it's important for us to know that the work that the Patus have done is rather incredible. The number 3,000 is very high for being able to recruit people in our communities. Generally, we do not like to speak to people about medical issues in a medical setting because there's so little trust. Um, that's getting better. I think that Downstate has gone a long way to improving that, but we still have that issue. And so Arthur Ashe Institute took their initiatives into barbershops and salons, um, and they actually do programming there where they both ask questions, they both they do training um, to really help people within the community get with the program in terms of their health. As well, Arthur Ashe is also um, involved in training URM or underrepresented minority students who are at high school level and actually they go all the way down to middle school in terms of training students around issues pertaining to our populations. Um, I want to just say that we are very fortunate to have this type of arrangement. There are a lot of places that don't. We're lucky to have run into you, Albany, because they also believe in this type of approach. Um, but essentially, this says an agreement to do something together that will benefit all involved is what a community academic partnership is about. OK, so the strategy for partnerships is bringing people together building on strengths that exist in the community, and seeing the community as leaders, messengers, and advocates. So Arthur Ashe has developed um, a community advisory board, and they actually meet with them on a regular basis. That community advisory board has also been of great service to Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. These are people who are in the trenches seeing what's going on. Um, and really giving feedback about, number one, what types of issues our communities are facing, number two, how we might best address them, um, because often, as professionals, we feel we know better. Not the case. So I won't belabor the point, but it's all about seeing community as a leader, as leaders in developing treatment plans. Okay, so the partnerships center around research, around funding, around resources, commitment to addressing health disparities, um, credibility. So for many of the um, places that are seeking to do research in the community, 
they don't have the credibility to be able to do the types of research that are done here at Downstate. So if a community organization is not affiliated with an academic institution, it is most likely that they will be limited in the types of uh, research they can approach. So we offer them some kind of backup for doing the types of research they'd like to look at, and they help us by providing us with information about the community. Um, the community also offers us dissemination options so that we feed out to the community the findings uh, regarding the research that we've done, the findings regarding what we think should be looked at, and again, we keep getting feedback from the community. Um, as well, the research that community organizations do assist them with building capacity, right? So um, I led a mental health agency years ago. Um, and essentially, if you're not one of the big guys, you don't get, you cannot get resources in the community. And in many cases, these decisions are political. And so you do need to have people you're partnering with to be able to take your treatment further and to make your treatment more pointed and more relevant to the community you're serving. And as well, the partnership offers you the opportunity on both, in both directions to develop expertise in the area you're addressing. Okay, so um, Marilyn has put this slide here to talk about resources that are on both sides, on community side and on academia side. Um, so CBOs, community-based organizations, have a knowledge of the community. Um, they help with research and health priorities. They, in some ways, they also understand some of the policy issues. Um, they can help us to develop trust, to develop our credibility, because again, just marching into uh, a neighborhood um, or into an organization without that trust does not work often. Um, they help with recruitment, and they have that commitment to community and health disparities. On the academic side, we have an expertise in research, and I want to point out that um, the Patus talked about thousands of people they've seen. Um, and it's not easy to get thousands of people in our community. Um, so many of the academic environments have a hard time because they're not really getting the numbers that would allow them to speak intelligently about what kinds of treatments are relevant for our population. Um, we also have faculty with commitment to the community, and that is part of why um, we've developed this program, um, this endowment program, because many times the faculty who are not familiar with the community, who don't study the issues pertaining to the community, don't have the same commitment. And so we are, it is our desire and hope to train underrepresented minority students and faculty who would then turn around and have a commitment to this particular community. Um, again, uh, with a, on the academic side, we have the tools to help with publication. Publication in, in the community is not easy. And so for a variety of reasons, there are not the resources to do it without an academic uh, partnership. Um, funding, of course, which comes through actually doing the, um, the larger studies. And I just want to talk about this funding thing a bit. Um, we have some rules as to what types of research we go after. And in general, we have focused, because we're a limited shop, we focused on larger funding or larger grants. Does anybody have an idea of why we've done that? OK, I'm a different kind of speaker. you, you got to talk to me. Why have we focused on larger grants? Wow. 
Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> Say that again. Okay. Oh, indirect. Okay, so tell me what that means, Dr. Taylor. Okay, that's certainly an aspect. Would you like to add? I'm going to add a third reason. It sort of doesn't matter what size the grant is, the work on it is the same. So if you're applying for a $50,000 grant or a $250,000 grant, the person who is administering that grant feels that their money is equally important. So if you're going to go for it, as Dr. Salafu has indicated, you've got to submit a lot. And you've got to have some failures. And you've got to be able to withstand that so that you can get to the amount of money that will really help you address the problem. So if you have sort of someone calling you about the grant and making a lot of requirements and it's $25,000 with which you can do very little, um, it's better to have a person calling you and kind of helping you to get the larger grant together so that you can really, really do and address what it is that you're addressing. That makes sense? OK, I've got a couple of head nods. All right. Um, Again, academia always needs to work on credibility because often people have traditionally gone off on their own studying what they felt was important without relating to the community. So again, CBOs, community participation, community involvement, very, very important. Okay, effective partnerships include first, agreement on a shared goal, um, next decision-making authority, deciding how you're going to include uh, the community in that. And it's not as easy as you might think. Sometimes the grant precludes, I'm sorry, sometimes the grant precludes your being able to do things in a particular way, but as much as possible, we want to include um, community um, in decision-making. Um, sharing resources. So here at, um, I know at Arthur Ashe, there are often times when we do meetings because Arthur Ashe is a part of Brooklyn Health Disparities Center and there's every attempt to share resources in that regard. There's training that is offered um, free of charge. All of that we try to share as much as possible and developing the community is a common goal. OK, so ineffective partnerships, obviously partners who don't share a common vision and values, unequal resources, funds, expertise, et cetera, um, unequal decision making and lack of transparency, hidden agendas do not foster effective partnerships. Um, cultural and linguistic lapses uh, contribute to poor access uh, to healthcare services. I'm probably not doing this presentation as well as Marilyn would have done it, but I can say to you that the, the whole issue of how we appreciate culture and all of the things we're studying, very, very important. So I'm on a committee here where we're looking at people's food choices. And of course, we know that food choices um, have a cultural element to them. Um, but because they have a cultural element, we don't say we can't change this community or we can't help the community to understand what it is that we're trying to say about food choices. Rather, we try to understand what those food choices are about and we try to give people information so that they can make informed choices about what it is that they're doing in terms of their food. Um, so I'm going to move on. Obviously, if people cannot understand us linguistically, people can't understand us, they really don't know what we're saying. Um, and I've been in situations where patients are sitting before you, doctors or therapists or whatever are just going on and on. The person is doing this. And there is no investigation of whether the person understands what you're saying really. 
So we have many, many patients who are very compliant. You know, when they go to the doctor, okay? But they don't really understand what the doctor is saying, you know? Um, and that's a, a, another cultural issue that we need to know about. For many, many folks in our community, going to a doctor can be this very elevated experience. I have a mother who's had four strokes, and so when she's with us, there's a certain level of functioning. When she goes to the doctor, you would think she didn't have any strokes. She pulls it together. Her speech is affected, but it's not as affected when she goes to her doctor. So we just need to know how culture informs how people function. There is, I'm, I'm going to skip some of this, but the important um, aspect here is that information is largely in the domain of health professionals and their institutions. And what that speaks to is how we disseminate. Okay, so if we're disseminating at this very, very high level that no one understands, and it's not English, again, we're gonna get this. Yes, we understand, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the person won't do a thing that you've asked because in essence, you have not made sure that they really understand the information. Um, I'm gonna do understand that I'm seeing these slides for the second time. The first being opening them on my phone when Marilyn called me, so. Um, Disrip is a program that has been started in the city, um, really trying to address this whole issue of how we, we include navigation of our health system, how we include um, health literacy and cultural competency, et cetera, et cetera. There are some people who may be in the room who are involved in it. Certainly, uh, uh, Dr. South, who has been involved with DISRIP, and it's really meaning to address the whole idea of the disparities in treatment, the disparities in how it's delivered, the disparities in resources, et cetera. Arthur Ashe is very involved with DISRIP at this point, um, and so we just wanted to point that out. Um, this one, I am not sure about. I'm skipping it. Okay. All right, so essentially, um, this slide implies that uh, the path to achieving health equity involves some of the uh, social factors, including housing, educational opportunities, quality, affordable health care, neighborhood conditions, environmental quality, et cetera, et cetera, income, et cetera. Um, but, you know, the path to health equity is one that we have to just keep in front of mind because there are times that we don't recognize what is going on and how people are being affected by what's happening in their community, including the amount of post-traumatic stress disorder our community um, uh, experiences. I won't go into that. Um, I'm going to, all right. So the role of the community, knowledge of health issues, advocates for change, active partners, which is about the community-based participatory research, and the CAB, which is um, sharing the research and the policy agenda. The CAB is the Community Advisory Board. And again, as much as possible, Arthur Ashe seeks to engage them in both the research and the potential policy implications. One of the things that we've been struggling with at uh, the Disparity Center is how to turn some of the findings that we have into actual policy. Not as easy as you might think, but um, we are really at the forefront of trying to address that. And that was really the rationale for having the borough president's office involved with the center. Okay, so this is the model for Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. You've heard about this already. Um, and the CBOs are at the center because they actually provide the information that helps us to interpret what we should study and how we should study it. 
Okay, um, this is community-based uh, participatory research relationships. I can't even read it from here, but um, essentially, all of these are factors that go into the way that these relationships go forward positively. All right, this is something that I've had to get used to. Okay, so um, community priorities uh, include social determinants. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just not able to read it as well as I should, but um, we've got socioeconomic status, housing, we've got um, unemployment, we have health concerns, um, which include some of the major ones include hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Um, and these are the research activities on this side and the policy recommendations based upon the health care um, concerns. Um, and this is how Arthur Ashe has really um, developed their programming. Um, Arthur Ashe, by the way, is a 501c3. So even though they're part of the hospital, they have their own 501c3 status. So they can actually ask for grants and whatnot separate from the hospital. All right. Um, one of the things that Arthur Ashe does with the students is every year they have an actual opportunity for the students to present their research work. Um, and it, it is so important. You just have no idea how important some of the research is that these the young people who go through Arthur Ashe's programming is. Um, they've, they've done things that we've even looked at and said, gee, we didn't think about that. Um, so I'm going to focus on that on this slide. Um, they have a graduation ceremony, but they also have the students actually begin to be able to write. Um, and incredibly, the students are excellent in this domain. Um, the summer internship program began in 2010 uh, for Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. Uh, students were recruited from a program within um, Arthur Ashe, and they received training. They conducted over 60 research products, projects, and we've re replicated this program in Trinidad and Tobago, which is an incredible occurrence. So Arthur Ashe is international. All right, so these are the lessons learned. Need for innovative intervention programs, culturally tailored interventions are essential to effectively reducing health disparities. Utilizing community resources is important. Bi-directional partnerships are needed. And we should involve the community in all aspects of the program. So for the future, um, the uh, Arthur Ashe is really interested in getting more participation of the researchers here with the actual CBOs. Okay, um, that's a tough one because often the researchers wish to be somewhat distant from the community and from you know the detail of dealing with community partnerships. It's not just smooth and easy all of the time. Um, we should revisit shared research and policy agenda, grant collaboration with CBOs, researchers, and government officials. Um, and in particular, Arthur Ashe does a lot with the Delphi survey, um, which, which was mentioned before. But they actually have groups of people meet to discuss um, various issues uh, pertaining to health. And they give, again, feedback about directions that research should take. OK. That one is pretty obvious. And thank you.